Well, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the Wilson Center. I'm Robert Daly. I direct the Kissinger Institute on China and the United States. And we are here this afternoon to talk about Professor David Shambaugh's newest book, China's Leaders from Mao to Now, uh, which walks us through uh, the, the eras of Mao Zedong, Deng Xiaoping, Jiang Zemin, Hu Jintao, and now Xi Jinping, an extremely timely book. Because as China is reaching out now for greater global influence, as its relationship with the United States gets more contentious, and as Xi Jinping is carrying out a commercial and cultural rectification campaign, and as he seems poised to extend his power beyond the two five-year uh, terms that have become customary, we need more than ever an understanding of the leadership of China's Communist Party. And that is what this book provides. Professor Shambaugh doesn't only look at the policies and the challenges each of China's five premier leaders have faced in the era of his service. He also analyzes what we know of their childhoods, of their psychologies, their rivalries, and their failures. And he does this using multiple frameworks from a range of disciplines. China itself, needless to say, does not provide this kind of analysis of its leaders. I also want to say, uh, David, that this book just reads extremely well. It's like listening to you speak. It's, it's got a very natural flow, and I could hear your voice uh, throughout it. And so I, I strongly recommend it uh, to our listeners today. David Shambaugh uh, doesn't need an introduction, especially at the Woodrow Wilson Center, but I will tell you anyway that he is the Gaston Segur Professor of Asian Studies at George Washington University. And he is also the founding director of the China Policy Program at the Elliott School of International Affairs at GW. He has had a very long uh, and storied career. I won't go through every single aspect of it, but he has served as the editor of the China Quarterly, and he is an extremely prolific author. His books include China's Future, 2016, which we also launched, uh, here at the Wilson Center, and recently, Where Great Powers Meet, America and China in Southeast Asia uh, 2020, which we also brought to you uh, here at the Wilson Center. He has been both a Wilson Fellow and has also served as director of the Wilson Center's Asia program. In addition to uh, his many essays, his many books, we should note that he is also a teacher and has helped now to train, I don't know, David, how you would count, but at least three generations of China scholars. Uh, how many people in total? Uh, I would guess probably in the thousands. He is also uh, a valued colleague and is a leader of too many seminars and dialogues to count. Uh, but I've had the great pleasure of working with him closely on a number of projects over the past few years, including on the task force on US policy that is led by the Asia Society and the University of California at San Diego, uh, where David plays a key role. We're going to ask him first uh, to tell us about the book, and then we will turn to Ambassador Stapleton Roy as a discussant. Uh, Stape, as you know, is the distinguished scholar and the founding director emeritus here at the Kissinger Institute, uh, and has been involved in a number of uh, Professor Shambaugh's book launches. So we look forward to a discussion between the two of you. And then we ask our audience members, please, to send in their questions and comments. If you would send them to China at wilsoncenter.org, we will read them out. Again, that's China at wilsoncenter.org. If you do not want the question attributed to you personally, uh, please so note, and I will ask it for you anonymously. Again, welcome to everybody, and especially to Professor Shambaugh. Please tell us about your book. Wonderful, Robert. Thank you so much um, for that overly kind introduction and the invitation back to the Wilson Center. I just have to begin by saying what affection I have, I think is the only word for it, for the Wilson Center. It's meant an important uh, part of my life, um, dating back to the late 1980s when I first finished graduate school at the University of Michigan, uh, and before I went off to the School of Oriental and African Studies in London uh, to teach uh, for a decade, I did have a year in between those uh, at the Wilson Center as the uh, acting director of the Asia program. And that was just a wonderful uh, experience. And Wilson Center sort of been in my DNA ever since. As you say, I did also have the chance to return as a fellow. Um, gosh, I don't know, maybe a dozen years, 15 years ago, where I wrote 
uh, the previous book, uh, China's Communist Party Atrophy and Adaptation. So these issues have been with me uh, for a long time and in, in my uh, time at the Wilson Center. So great to be back virtually in person. Um, so thank you very much for, for hosting today's launch. Um, this, and, and I also just wanna thank uh, Ambassador Roy very much for taking the time to be uh, the discussant and joining this session. Very appropriate um, for many reasons, but because Ambassador Roy is actually I think interacted with every one of these five leaders that I study um, in, in this book, going back to Chairman Mao. He, he can correct me if, if I'm wrong about that, but Stape has lived quite literally and interacted with these leaders where I've, I've met a couple of them, um, uh, actually three of them. But um, anyway, that's uh, really wonderful to have you Stape. So, um, we look forward to that. And I wanna give the audience also as much time as possible to ask questions and have, have discussion. But let me start off if I can with uh, hopefully a rather abbreviated, <laughs> you know, this is a 450 page book or something. So very hard to compress that in five liters and 70 plus years, um, actually more than that because their lives predated 1949, you know, into, into sort of 15 minutes. But let me try and just, just sketch out for our, uh, our listeners and viewers today, uh, what this, this book's about. It, first thing to say is it's sort of been brewing in my brain literally my entire career. I've been telling people that I researched it for 40 years, but I wrote it in nine months. I actually literally did sit down when COVID uh, broke out um, and we didn't know how long we were gonna be locked down or locked in for. I had just finished my previous book on Southeast Asia that we launched um, last year. And I thought to myself, okay, David, now's the time to sort of write this book that's been brewing in your brain for four decades and you've been teaching in the classroom. Actually, all my students uh, will recognize a lot of what I say today and what's in the book. Um, so literally, this is a sort of product of, an, of my whole career, I have to say. Um, and um, I've been interested my whole career in China's leaders. I'm one of these, uh, I don't know what you call it, sort of inside the ring road. <laughs> um, or inside the Jungnan High focused China scholar, um, more interested in, in the policy process, the leaders themselves, the institutions of the central government uh, in China. I'm not one to uh, spend much time in my career having looked uh, really in the countryside or outside the capital. So I've been fascinated by leaders, you know, Chinese leaders, um, their styles, their ideologies, their strategies and tactics, um, how they, how the, what they, that they adopt, how they interact with each other, how they navigate what is really a pretty ruthless and often brutal system um, and um, unpredictable system in many ways too, um, which levers of power they use, um, how those are different from one another and how they impact Chinese society and in fact, uh, beyond China's borders and interact with leaders from other countries. So um, I've sort of been fascinated by, by these pathologies, you might say, of, of leaders over time. I've also been really fascinated from the beginning of my undergraduate studies, I have to say, um, at George Washington University under Professor Harold Hinton with Leninist style political systems, what used to be called <laughs> when I was in graduate school, the field of comparative communism. Um, there aren't many communist countries left to compare, so the field has sort of gone away. Um, but it was uh, in its heyday when I was in undergraduate and graduate school. So I look at the Chinese political system not just as a Chinese system. I look at it as a Leninist system with Chinese characteristics, you might say. Um, and I've been very interested in the sort of pathologies and the uniqueness of those types of systems as distinct from other types of authoritarian and totalitarian systems. So the book actually begins with the first chapter uh, contextualizing how to think about Chinese leaders and, and Leninist systems. Um, also a little bit, I draw upon leadership studies of other systems, including all the way back to Max Weber and uh, uh, Fred Greenstein who studied American presidents, you know, and um, so I, I do, I did tap into the sort of leadership uh, literature, um, which is now quite interesting and it's contributed to by a number of social scientists and including psychologists 
Um, and I take some of what I learned from reading that literature and apply it to these five individuals. So um, the book is, as you noted, Robert, about uh, the five main so-called paramount leaders, Mao, Deng, Jiang Zemin, Hu Jintao, and of course now Xi Jinping. In that context, though, of course, I talk about many other leaders in each of those time periods. Hua Gufang, Zhao Ziyang, Hu Yaobang, Chen Yun, Liu Xiaoqi, uh, and others. So they get mentioned, to be sure, but the chapters are organized around the five principal uh, leaders. And the book is about the leaders, but it's also about their times. So it's a history um, of sorts. It's a, certainly a political history. I would argue it's also an economic, social, military, ideological, and foreign affairs history. I try and wrap all those elements into each of the uh, five chapters. So, uh, you know, it's hopefully will be used, you know, in the classroom or will just be a kind of good uh, kind of one-stop shop for people who want to sort of get a survey, the sweeping survey of, of the People's Republic of China. So um, with that background, what about these five? Well, I have uh, descriptors I use for each of them, sort of subtitles um, in each of the, of the chapters. And so let me give you those descriptors and explain why I describe each uh, person, each leader that way. So starting with Mao, I call him a populist tyrant um, because he repeatedly tried to tap into what's called today populism, <laughs> appealing to the downtrodden, dispossessed, disaffected elements of society uh, in China. Mao is also deeply anti-institutionalist, I would say, and anti-elitist. Uh, politician. And he repeatedly sought to appeal directly to the masses and circumvent, in fact, institutions and bureaucracies. And then, of course, he, he launched a full-scale war on institutions and bureaucracies in the Cultural Revolution. Um, you might even want to call him an anarchist, in, at least in that phase. Um, but Mao also had innate faith, I would say, in the so-called masses and their ability to exercise kind of collective agency um, and change deeply rooted Chinese practices and norms and institutions. So uh, populist, he was also a Marxist, um, but I would say Mao is not particularly a Leninist um, when it came to utilizing party or state institutions. Quite to the contrary, he distrusted them and he tried to destroy them if, and circumvent them, certainly. And if he couldn't circumvent them, they tried to destroy them. Mao, of course, is also a revolutionary, um, very much so. I would argue of the Trotskyite variety, uh, seeking perpetual revolution and the export of it. Um, he was also, of course, one of the one of the great, if that's the right adjective for it, great despots and tyrants of the 20th century in the League of Hitler and Stalin, in the number of deaths uh, that occurred on his watch. So these two elements for Mao, the kind of populist element, you know, the, the individual who cultivated the masses, yet also stigmatized and terrorized several segments of the population, they stand in, in, in uh, contradiction to each other, yet they capture, I think, the, the main elements of his uh, rather schizophrenic leadership style. His lasting legacy, in my mind, a mixed, but generally very negative. On the one hand, he is recognized by Chinese as the father of their republic. You know, his, his portrait still hangs on Tiananmen Gate. His body still lies in Tiananmen Square. Um, and he's, he's revered, I think it is to say, uh, in China. And, it's, and oddly so, with the passage of time, he's become even more revered. And he's thought of as the leader who has restored China's unity and dignity. Um, he was, he's a philosopher statesman. Um, and he's respected uh, in today's China. Um, on the other hand, uh, his rule is defined, I think, by extreme unpredictability, unrelenting, and extraordinary repression and brutality. And he was personally responsible for causing great domestic chaos, retarding China's development. So I don't give him very high marks. You may recall Deng Xiaoping gave him 70% good, 30% bad. Back in 1982 party resolution, I'd flip that. I'd say 70% bad, 30% good at best. So I'm not a big fan of Chairman Mao's. Um, Dong, um, I call in that chapter a pragmatic Leninist. Now that's for obvious reasons. We all know Dong was a pragmatist. 
um, mainly in his economic, but also in his foreign policy, I would argue, as summed up famously in his statement, doesn't matter if a cat is black or white, as long as it catches mice, it's a good cat. So um, the 80s and the Dung period, and indeed the early 60s, 61 to 65, when he was in charge of the economy and trying to put it back together again after the catastrophe of the Great Leap Forward that killed 40 million, that's four zero million people. Um, so he was a pragmatist and he experimented a lot. We're all familiar with those reforms, so we don't need to go into that. But why do I call him a pragmatic Leninist? Well, because Dung really uh, ruled through institutions, believed in institutions, rebuilt the institutions that Mao had torn down and assaulted during the Cultural Revolution. Um, and he was a real organization man in a kind of classic Leninist sense. He was in fact, the general secretary of the party in the mid fifties. So he strengthened the institutions of control. That's the essence to me of, of Leninism. He will be remembered, Dung, obviously for many things, but overturning the deleterious effects of Maoism, number one, I would say, and the Cultural Revolution in particular, and launching the country onto decades of reform and opening that have stimulated many of the processes that has brought China to the position of being a global power that it is today. Dung kicked that off. His accomplishments in foreign policy also very significant, including establishing diplomatic relations with the United States, um, normalizing ties with the Soviet Union and opening relations with Asian and European countries. Yet the 1989 Tiananmen massacre is obviously the most obvious and lasting stain on his legacy. But I obviously, I think very well of Dung on the whole, give him very high marks, I don't know, 90% good, 10% bad, perhaps, if I was a professor and graded him. Jiang, turning to Jiang Zemin, um, I describe him in the chapter as a bureaucratic politician. Now, this is because when Jiang was catapulted to the top of the system in 1989, June, uh, just after the Tiananmen massacre and following the purge of Zhao Zui as the general secretary on the eve of the Tiananmen massacre, uh, Zhang was helicoptered, they call it in China, helicoptered up from Shanghai. Maybe, I don't know, if, I think he flew in an airplane when, when he came to Beijing, not a helicopter, but it's a, it's a metaphor um, that the Chinese use for individuals who come from lower levels of provincial rule to the, to the very top of the system. So he was catapulted up there. He had no real power base. He had no power base. He had no real patrons other than a man named Wang Daohan, who was the mayor of Shanghai. He had no ties to the main party factions. He had no real relations with the military. He had no geographic base of power other than Shanghai itself. So he was perceived as a transitional figure that would, you know, maybe be in power, maybe not as long as Hua Gofeng, and he would be shoved aside and somebody else would, would come into power. He was viewed, he was not taken seriously and he was seen to be a temporary figure. He's also referred to as the flower pot at that time for somebody who looked pretty but had no substance. Um, well, Jiang Zemin stayed in power for 13 years, uh, the longest of any of the post Mao leaders. Um, so the question is how? Now, I argue in the book, and the reason I call him a bureaucratic politician um, is because he drew in his own background as a bureaucrat and an industrial bureaucrat in the state council system. And he turned it to his political advantage. You know, China may be a one party dictatorship, um, but it does have different constituencies throughout the country, geographic, factional, institutional patronage and bureaucratic. And I argue that Zhang, cultivated these various bureaucratic constituencies very effectively in the party, in the government, and in the military, in the internal security services, and other institutional organs. And he adopted their agendas, you might say, their institutional preferences, um, and made them his own, and thus effectively co-opting them. Uh, he saw bureaucracies as constituencies. So this is kind of a modern politics in a one-party system. Um, and he therefore mobilized support across these three big shitongs, these three big uh, bureauc bureaucratic systems, party, uh, government, military. And then he did what any politician would do in any system, shower them with resources. This was, of course, after Deng Xiaoping's Southern Tour of 1992 and China's economic boom, 
So there were a lot of money around and he showered them with resources, very, um, very astute in any political system, sort of Tip O'Neill style politics, you might say. And he promoted individuals that he met in those three systems in the first two years of being in office. So Zhang spent a lot of time in the first two years going out around the country. He visited all the military regions, visited, I think, almost all the provinces and many of these ministries inside Beijing. And then you see in the year three and four, a number of the individuals he met with and who escorted him on those inspection tours promoted to the top. So he used patronage, you might say, uh, as a, another uh, method of, of cultivating control. So um, I think he was very effective, um, surprisingly so. You know, he too, as I say, he was sort of dismissed um, when he certainly came to power. He's never really taken all that seriously, was in power. But looking back on him, I think there are a lot of positive elements of Jiang Zemin's legacy. He overcame the post Tiananmen international isolation. Uh, he oversaw the Hong Kong handover. He embraced economic policies that triggered the unprecedented boom of the 90s and beyond. He permitted, very importantly, and I sketch out in the book, what I call stealthy political reforms, which is not easy after June 4th. And his right-hand man, Zhang Ching Hong, is a man I give enormous credit to in the book. Um, not a household name, but I think a really important actor in China's, in the last uh, 20 years, or in the 90s and the 2000s, for political reform. Um, Zhang also set the military on a path to sustain modernization, and he revitalized the party. So overall, pretty positive, maybe 80-20, I don't know. Um, if there were significant downsides to his rule, it was the dramatic expansion of social disparity and proliferation of corruption on his watch. But looking back on it, particularly uh, in today's Xi Jinping's China, which we'll get to momentarily, the Zhang period was quite open and filled with a number of accomplishments. Um, so I, can, I think he gets high marks and history will continue to give him high marks as, as time passes. Then we turn quickly to uh, Hu Jintao and, and then Xi Jinping. Hu Jintao I describe in the book as a technocratic operatic. Why? Technocratic due to his training in engineering at Tsinghua. Indeed, Zhang Zemin was a technocrat too engineer at Jiao Tong uh, University in Shanghai. Operatic because his whole career was in the party bureaucracy, um, the inner party bureaucracy. This guy was an insider's insider, the quintessential party cadre. Um, almost, you know, you know, just a kind of cutout figure almost with hardly any persona. In fact, he was ridiculed for, you know, people would use adjectives to describe Hu Jintao as wooden, stiff, and then the proverbial joke, who's who, you know, does who have a personality? He was really bland uh, in his personal persona. Um, but, I, and I think a lot of observers um, sort of judged his policies on his persona. So, and when he left office, he and Wen Jiabao, the premier, uh, this was referred to as China's 10 lost years. So Chinese did not give him very, that's a Chinese term, not a foreign term, didn't give him very high marks. Um, but I think this description may be unfair. Um, he launched a number of policy initiatives, he and Wen Jiabao together, um, on their watch in social policy, party reform, and foreign policy. Um, and I think the verdict of his having few accomplishments is really not not appropriate, not fair. You know, there are a number of things that did occur on his watch. Uh, first of all, he shifted the overall policy emphasis away from the kind of growth at all costs uh, economic calculus under Jiang, Jiang Zemin, and the bias towards coastal China that existed under Jiang Zemin towards um, the interior of the country and a much more progressive policy agenda that emphasized social equality, social justice, improving basic living standards and social services, public health, environmental protection, poverty alleviation, relieving the burden on farmers, public safety, anti-corruption, and uh, many other things. So this was, he had a very distinctly different policy agenda than Jiang Zemin did. Um, and it was commendable, as I say, I would describe it as progressive. Um, that all was rolled out in his first five-year term. 
but it just faltered in the second five-year term. And um, there are reasons for that, I think, and the principal one being that he had never built an institutional power base in other bureaucracies. What he should have done is study Jiang Zemin's uh, playbook and cultivate those other bureaucracies because you have to implement policies when you come up with them. Um, Zhang, uh, Zhang did that, who I argue never did that. He did not use his 10 years in waiting as the heir apparent to Zhang effectively at all. So his, and Wen Jiaobao's policies basically floundered. But if you look back on it, you know, you can credibly claim at the end of his decade in power that he maintained social and political stability. He oversaw considerable economic growth. He did pay attention to the less fortunate sectors of society. Uh, he protected national security and continued military modernization. Very importantly, he opened ties with Taiwan, lying Joe on the other side of the Taiwan Strait, the so-called three links. That all happened under on Hu Jintao's watch. Um, and he enhanced uh, China's position uh, in the world, redirecting foreign policy from what, what I would call the major power focus to the global south. He turned away from Moscow and Washington and, and focused Chinese foreign relations south of the equator, I would argue, and prioritized the global south, started the BRICS and several other things. So I give him pretty good marks, actually, when I think back about it. He kept the party in power. He kept the country out of war. He opened, as I say, exchanges with Taiwan, and he enhanced the nation's standing in the world, all pretty important metrics by any standard. So I don't know, Hu Jintao, maybe 70, 30. Um, and lastly, so let's turn to uh, Xi Jinping um, briefly and then um, to the discussion. So I describe Xi in the book as a modern emperor. Why? Well, he rules China, in, in my view, during modern times in ways reminiscent, though, of some of China's historical emperors, all powerful, regal, fairly aloof, respected, feared, sycophantically revered, in singular control of all organs of state and military power, a believer in China's greatness, a promoter of China's imperial past, intolerable of insubordination and dissent, a proponent of ethical behavior, um, a setter of ideological doctrine, interpreter of the past, and visionary of the future. If you look at you know, sort of the job description of China's imperial emperors, those were features or characteristics of, of many of them. So I see him as kind of an emperor-like figure. Um, but a, a modern one as well, because he obviously seeks to make China a world, he has you know, world-class power, which it is today. So notwithstanding his goals and accomplishments, he's a divisive figure um, abroad. <laughs> we don't really know how divisive he is domestically. We just know anecdotally that uh, he's not as popular um, as, uh, as, as many may think certainly not amongst intellectuals, certainly not amongst ethnic groups, certainly not amongst party cadres that have been purged, certainly not amongst military officers that have been purged, certainly increasingly not amongst the private sector of the economy, which is unfolding in real time, his attacks on the private tech sector. Um, you know, and, and, the, and many people I think in China resent the uh, kind of retrograde uh, strict controls and, and draconian repression that has returned under Xi Jinping. I think many Chinese thought they were beyond that. Now, that was something that associated with the Maoist era or the post Tiananmen period. Well, it's back and uh, in ways that we haven't seen since, uh, since Tiananmen, post Tiananmen. He's steamrolled any opposition in the leadership, the party, the bureaucracies, the military, the security services, and decimated dissent in the country at large. Um, abroad, you know, we can go into this. I would say he's very uh, div divisive and controversial and with his more assertive as the adjective is usually used for Xi Jinping foreign policy that includes all kinds of things which, which we're familiar with and we can go into in discussion, but I don't think I'll take the time to do so. On balance, I would say Xi Jinping's report card so far, nine years into his term, mixed. I don't want to give a percentage to it, actually. Um, you know, no doubt he has had an outsized impact. Boy, if, if particularly when you think about in contrast to Hu Jintao, his predecessor, um, he has affected every dimension of Chinese society and, and institutions, um, and rather quickly. 
and surprised, I think, all China watchers and probably most Chinese as well. He exudes personal confidence. He exhibits an air of entitlement and sense of destiny. Um, and he's really uh, moved China forward as a world power. Um, it's not over his period in, 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 in office and in power. We don't know how long it's going to last. Indefinitely is the one thing I think we can say. Um, saving a black swan event, a health event, or a, a coup d'etat. Um, we can assume that he's going to be in power for some, some time to come. And the things that we've seen over the last nine years, uh, one can assume will continue uh, in, into the future. So I see Zhang, or sorry, she is a, as a, as a mixed uh, figure. He certainly has cleaned up corruption. He's sorted out a lot of the atrophy in the party uh, that existed when he came to power. Now he's turning, you might even say, to a kind of Hu Jintao agenda, a social agenda with this common prosperity theme. So we'll see, we'll see how it goes. But uh, clearly he's a very, uh, very uh, persuasive and pervasive uh, figure. So let me stop there and um, we can move on. Well, thank you, David. Again, for the audience, if you would like to ask a question, please send an email to china at wilsoncenter.org. Wilson Center is one word, china at wilsoncenter.org. Uh, we now turn to Ambassador Stapleton Roy for his thoughts and then a discussion uh, between uh, Stape and David before opening it up to audience questions. Stape. Uh, thanks, Robert. And David, thank you for that. Um, very good run through of your book. Uh, I found it totally fascinating, uh, in part because it enabled me to sort of relive experiences that I have had in China over the last 45 years, when I have interacted with many, but not all of the leaders that you focus on um, in the book. Mao is the key exception. I was working on Soviet Union affairs in the State Department for the for nine of the last 10 years of Mao's life. And I only returned to Chinese um, affairs in time to participate in drafting the condolence message to the Chinese government on the death of Mao Zedong. But with uh, Deng Xiaoping and Jiang Zemin in particular, with uh, I had uh, not only uh, the experience of sitting in on many meetings with them, but actually, uh, in the case of Deng, I participated in two six-person private lunches, and with Deng Xiao and with uh, Jiang Zemin, uh, six-person uh, dinner uh, uh, sessions, during which there was free and uh, give and take, and you could sort of uh, explore issues. And it was very unusual to have that opportunity to get a feel for leaders in that fashion. I had retired from the government by the time Hu Jintao and Xi Jinping um, uh, took office, but through my association with uh, Dr. Kissinger, I accompanied him on numerous visits to China, in which he would always meet with one of the top Chinese leaders. And as a result, I've sat in on a, a number of meetings with both Hu Jintao and uh, Xi Jinping. In fact, I hosted a breakfast for Xi Jinping while he was still the party secretary uh, in Jiang Supra, um, in Zhejiang, uh, in Zhejiang um, uh, province. I thought that you captured the personalities of these people exactly right. Uh, and uh, it, it, it was very heartening to see that I, I, I don't have to comment in terms of, well, you got this wrong, you didn't quite get th this right. Uh, uh, but I can add some personal sort of examples to illustrate uh, the leaders that you write about so effectively in the book. For example, in the um, one of the small lunches I participated in with Deng Xiaoping was in honor of former U.S. President Gerald Ford, uh, who visited China in 1981 when I was the charge of the American embassy, and I was included in the lunch that Deng Xiaoping hosted for him. And they got into the discussion of political reform. And uh, Ford pushed Deng on the question of, you know, why didn't they open up and permit multiple parties? 
and Dung gave a, a Dungist response. He said, what China needs is economic development. China can only get economic development under conditions of stability, and China can only have stability under conditions of rule by one party. Now, there's no Marxism in that justification for one party rule in China. It's entirely a pragmatic explanation of why Deng felt so strongly that you had to keep the China Communist Party uh, in charge to ensure that China would be able to develop. Even in private conversation, Deng Xiaoping would not criticize Mao. But he made it clear that his view on economic development was different from Mao. One of the quotes attributed to Deng is to get rich is glorious. In other words, in Deng's mind, the purpose of the communist revolution was to do what Xi Jinping talks about in terms of the China dream, wealth and power. And Deng Xiaoping was particularly focused on the wealth aspect. He wanted China to raise its standard of living, and uh, he deserves credit, I think, for having done an extraordinary uh, job in that respect. Uh, another example reflecting the type of people that Deng supported. Uh, Gerald Ford had a meeting with Zhao Ziyang, who was the premier of China at the time. And it was an extraordinary conversation because Zhao Ziyang, the, uh, later became the general secretary of the Chinese Communist Party, but was the premier of China, was bemoaning the fact that he didn't have a market system to set prices for China. So he said, you don't know how lucky you are. Your prices tell people what to produce. I end up with quota systems where I end up with 10 million pairs of trousers that nobody wants. And Gerald Ford, who comes, of course, from our steel-eating uh, state of Michigan, cautioned Zhao Ziyang not to put too much emphasis on light industry because heavy industry really was important. And I thought, what is the American former president sounding like Stalin and talking about the Neil for steel industries while the Chinese communist premier is talking about the need for a market to set prices so he doesn't end up with the wrong things being produced. It was a very interesting conversation, but it also illustrated that Zhao Ziyang understood what markets were for. And I lived in the Soviet Union when they were experimenting with uh, price reform, and they didn't dare touch it. And three years after the conversation with Gerald Ford, China launched the most thorough price reform of any communist country. And when I returned to China 10 years after that conversation, all of the goods that had been in scarce uh, supply uh, during the 70s and early 80s were now abundantly available in the stores. In other words, the price reform was, was brilliantly successful. Uh, Deng was one of the key features of Deng, which I don't think is adequately appreciated. Deng was impatient with people who didn't recognize that to accomplish a good purpose, you sometimes have to avoid actions that will prevent you from accomplishing the purpose. So for example, he developed a particular animus, anger, against Fang Li Zhe, the physicist who at the end of the 1980s was advocating political reform in China. And the reason Deng could not tolerate those sorts of people was because they wanted to take actions, which in the case of Gorbachev, had completely destabilized the Soviet Union and prevented Gorbachev from accomplishing his purposes. And for Deng, this was clearly evident 
and he couldn't understand people who were carried away by humanitarian impulses and unable to carry out tough tasks that weren't easy to accomplish. And this is reflected at every stage in Deng's approach to things. Where he differed most from Mao was if Deng encountered difficulties, he would pull back and wait until he could get things in place to move ahead again. But when he moved ahead again, it was in the same direction. And that's what happened between 1989 and 1992, which was a really difficult time in China. And you carry, you handled that, I thought, uh, very well, because essentially Deng lost influence. He couldn't get his views published. When I returned to China as ambassador in 1991, it was clear from reading the, the official press that there was a two-line ideological struggle taking place. And it took the Southern tour uh, in 1982, uh, in like, excuse me, 1992, the spring of 92, in order to turn the tide around. Uh, and, but when reform and openness resumed, it went like gangbusters in the same direction that they had been moving before. Uh, it raises a big issue, which I'm going to ask you to comment on a little later. Some people have put forward the theory that if it hadn't been for Mao's vicious attack on traditional Chinese culture, that Deng Xiaoping would have been unable to successfully push forward with reform and openness. In other words, China had been held back for decades, ever since the Qinghai Revolution and the Qing reformers, by wanting to do modernization in a Chinese way. And the problem is, there was no Chinese way to successfully carry out modernization. And if you want to be brutally frank, you could argue that essentially what Deng did was what the Japanese had done in the Meiji Restoration in Japan. He had been willing to not pursue a Japanese approach, the Meiji restorers, but essentially aped the European and American uh, uh, modernization processes. And Deng, in essence, did that. He was willing to bring in the Western market forces to China as a way of moving ahead uh, uh, economic production, and he wouldn't have been able to do that if Mao hadn't been so devastating in his attack on traditional Chinese culture during the Cultural Revolution. It's an interesting question, and we can come uh, back to that. I thought your uh, book was particularly valuable in exposing the vicious infighting that takes place beneath the surface in authoritarian regimes. Uh, in democracies, usually those struggles take place in the open. But in many authoritarian regimes, you can't afford to talk openly about conflicting viewpoints because there's information control. As a result, you have to read between the leaves in order to understand what's going on. And you are an expert in this, and that's reflected in your book, because in running through the various um, uh, factional struggles, uh, you really capture a sense of what was going on. I particularly like the attention you paid to the transition from Mao to Deng Xiaoping, the five-year period during which Deng Xiaoping and Hua Guofeng were in competition with each other. And I was interested in this because I had just switched back to Chinese affairs. And my first trip back to China uh, took place in 1976, when I accompanied the House Armed Services Committee on a visit to China in April of 1976. It took place two weeks after the demonstrations that you talk about uh, expressing irritation that Zhou Enlai's death had not been commemorated uh, properly. And the delegation met with uh, 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 Zhang Chunqiao, uh, one of the Gang of Four. And he is the only Chinese leader at a senior level 
who really talked ideology in a private meeting. Every other Chinese leader, and I'm talking about general secretaries of the Communist Party, the premiers and people of this sort, in private conversations, they are totally non-ideological in the way that they discuss issues. But Zhang Chunqiao was the exception. But I then went back a year later in 77 in April, and I went back again with a congressional delegation in April of 1978. Each time we had exactly the same handlers, and each time the political line was totally different. In 1976, Deng Xiaoping was the demon, and we were taken to kindergartens where the kids sang a song that Deng Xiaoping was an out and out capitalist roader. And in 77, the evil people were the gang of four that had just been thrown out. And in 78, Deng Xiaoping was the good guy. No mention of Hua Guofeng in all of this, uh, but an indication that clearly the political winds were changing inside China. It's amusing that when we met with Zhang Chunqiao in April of 1976, he sat back and said, people say there's disorder in China. Well, you've been to Tiananmen Square. It was completely passive, quiet, right? He said, China is completely stable. And within six months, of course, he had been purged with the rest of the gang of four. So those are the kind of little insights that you gain from the, these types of, uh, uh, of, of visits to China. I think that Jiang Zemin, I share your high estimation of him. But, and you touch on it. He was an atypical Asian leader because his personal mannerisms were not those of traditional Asian leaders. Uh, as you say, he was extroverted. He liked to relax and tell jokes. Uh, he, all, he would quote from the Gettysburg Address in English. Another of his favorites was The Sorrows of Young Werther, and he liked to quote from that. His favorite movie was The, um, the Great Waltz. And he liked, he'd be meeting with a delegation and he would uh, begin to sing songs from The Great Waltz in order to illustrate that he knew the movie very well. Uh, his background music at banquets for foreign visitors often was uh, Beethoven's Rage Over a Lost Penny. Uh, and uh, that was the type of music that he liked. He really took pride in his exposure to Western culture. And he unfortunately was totally mishandled by the Americans. And having become the ambassador in China during that period, my problem was Westerners, including senior US officials, tended to treat him as though he were a buffoon because of the fact that he would laugh and joke and tell stories and things like that. But what I noted was that of all the leaders in China, I was there for four years, he was the only one whose position kept getting stronger. And so I would have arguments with my own staff over the question of whether he was a buffoon or not a buffoon. And my position was, in communist systems, you never end up with a buffoon at the top. So don't, don't treat the personal mannerisms as an accurate reflection of what the person himself is like. Stape, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to um, jump in if I could for a minute because we've only got about 10 minutes left. Oh, I thought we had an hour and a half. No, we have, we, we, we have 10 minutes and the, uh, there are quite a few audience questions. I wanted to get to some of those oh, if I could. Well, well, I'm sorry. I wish you had known that at the first. I had it down on my calendar for an hour and a half. Uh, I, 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 I will end, end um, uh, quickly. Uh, okay. Well, we've, let me go. There's a question here about, about Xi Jinping. Um, for Professor Shambaugh, it says, you describe Xi Jinping as emperor-like. What do you think are the historical or cultural factors that have caused Xi Jinping to adopt this draconian style? 
are there any factors from his predecessors that may have resulted in the, the changes of style and approach that we see under Xi Jinping? Well, one of the um, interesting question, one of the surprises to me uh, in researching this book, um, of course, when you're doing biographical research um, or when you're researching contemporary leaders, you always want to go back in their personal biographies and their uh, professional biographies to try and establish linkages between the time of their periods before they got to office and then their behavior once they got into office. Um, which is very difficult to do with a uh, communist system, first of all, because they don't provide a lot of, of informa biographical information. There's a lot of hag hagiographic, you know, um, retroactive history, you might say. Um, but in looking at Xi Jinping, you know, I was surprised to find that there was, or I didn't find, I should say, linkages between his previous career and his life and the kind of draconian leader he has been since uh, 2012. You know, we all know, and we don't have time to go into uh, his biography, um, but, you know, here's a man who, uh, at age 14, his own father was purged by Mao and kept under house arrest at first. And so he had to physically watch his father at home in house arrest before his father was actually incarcerated. So, you know, that would have taught somebody about the capriciousness of, of rule and, you know, the ill effects of, of purges perhaps. Well, not so. Uh, you know, there are lots of things we can go into, you know, that are mysteries about his, his past, but he um, does not have evidence. There's no evidence in his time as the, you know, a teenager in, in Beijing, his time out in Shanxi, he spent seven years in the northern steppes of Sh Shanxi province, which are very formative for him. I mean, if, actually, there's, if there's one linkage, it was those years. I think he, he thinks that uh, the down to the countryside youth program of the Cultural Revolution was a very good thing. <laughs> and he's, what he's doing now, I think, uh, he's not launching a new one, but uh, his, you know, policies towards youth at present and the kind of moral society he's trying to create uh, at present and the kind of frugal party he's been trying to create, I think do emanate out of his period of time in, in Northern Shanxi. But other than that, you can go through the Fujian years. He spent 15 years in Fujian. He spent four years in Zhejiang. He spent a year in Shanghai. Um, and I went through those periods with a fine tooth comb and can find little connection between what he did in those places and what he did at the top once he got to the top. So, you know, it's just kind of a, a mystery, uh, really. Um, but it's one of the problems of trying to do work on, on Chinese, Chinese leaders. So I don't know if that addresses the person's question, but um, you don't know. I mean, we didn't know what Gorbachev was going to be like. He was just an operatic. He was kind of a Hu Jintao of the Soviet system out in the oblast right? Just another operatic. And well, he becomes a leader and kaboom, we saw what happened with Perestroika and Glasnost in, in the Soviet system. Where did that come from? So, you know, the, the kind of what I called in my last book, neo-totalitarianism, um, is what we've seen under Xi Jinping, but there were no signs that I could find in his previous career to suggest that's the, that kind of retrograde, repressive, emperor-like, all-powerful individual that we have seen um, you know, there are no indication that that's what uh, was coming based on his past uh, past career. Well, that leads well into the next question, which is from Donald and Karen Barnes. It's, it's about continuity. And you, you pointed out, you know, these five very different leaders, but do you see through these studies any continual threads or themes or trajectories that you can trace across all five men? And if so, if there is a continuity, does that have any implications for China's future? Hmm. Um, well, I uh, take that on in the first chapter, in fact, and I argue at the very outset that I was looking for continuities. I had anticipated continuities between these individuals, right? They all, because they all rule in the same uh, political system. Um, and I was struck at the end of the book, and I argue in the book, the discontinuities between the five. And if you just think of the five, Mao, Deng, Zhang, Hu, Xi, uh, 
very different leadership styles, very different personas, as uh, Ambassador Roy just pointed out. Um, so in fact, it's the discontinuities that uh, surprised me and came through. And the continuities that exist, I attribute more to the system and to institutions and to political culture. Now, in the first chapter of the book, I spent a lot of time on what I call and what I have great admiration for the um, late Sinologist Lucian Pye, who is the father of the political culture approach to the study of politics, not just in China, but worldwide. Um, and I have a lot of, I spent a fair amount of time in the first chapter on Chinese political culture and the continuity. So um, over time, not just in communist China, but uh, over time from imperial to present day uh, China. So I mean, again, we don't have much time, but um, you may want to look at that. Um, but the continuities have more, more to do with the institution and with the traditional culture, I would say, than the individual men. Um, so I think I'll just pause there so we can squeeze in some more questions. Here's, here's one from Alyssa Briggs that I think both of you may want to comment on. Um, so why don't we go uh, Stape and, and then David. Uh, what is one myth about China that you see currently in favor among American policymakers regarding its leaders or its system that you believe may be misleading or harmful? How do you think we are misperceiving China and its leaders right now? Very briefly, I think we are failing to understand and differentiate between Chinese actions that reflect a buoyant rising power type of hubris, which is characteristic of all rising powers, and cases, particularly in the case of Taiwan, where China is actually reacting to actions by the United States or Taiwan that we think are perfectly justified, but which if you understand China's view on the question, you will realize are highly offensive to China and guaranteed to elicit a response. And one of the reasons we have high tensions with China right now over Taiwan is precisely because of that factor. We're not understanding how provocative we and Taiwan are being because we refuse to understand <laughs> the framework that China is determined to maintain with respect to Taiwan. Um, I would agree completely with Ambassador Roy. The only thing that comes to mind I would add of what Americans are missing in our understanding of Chinese leaders, uh, this current Chinese leader, actually I would, first thing I would say is I think we understand him pretty darn well. And what you see is what you get. I don't think there's a lot of misperception of the Chinese leader or the system. Um, but having said that, the one thing that does come to mind is that we assume other leaders and other systems, whether, you know, just various systems are, are rational and pragmatic. And they kind of make rational calculated decisions on a cost benefit basis. Um, and that tends to underplay um, emotive, uh, affective, nationalistic, uh, hubristic, and other uh, sort of emotions that animate publics and animate individual leaders. So I think we're, the kind of uh, persona that we are seeing from Xi Jinping, from China collectively under Xi Jinping, um, you know, is is uh, not based on on what we would call you know sort of rationality, and I don't think you know we can necessarily assume rational behavior. Uh, from that regime. David, one last question. Uh, in terms of legacy and impact on China, do you think that Zhu Rongji's work uh, bears comparison with any of the five uh, premier leaders that you've described? Is, is he up in that, uh, is he in the same class in terms of his impact on China? Well, I uh, would say he's, he's yes, he's a he's, um, very important individual. There are a number of other individuals uh, that have populated the leadership over the last 70 years that I do talk about, Zhu included. Zhao Ziyang, I spent a lot of time on. I wrote my first book on Zhao Ziyang. I look at Hu Yaobang, I look at Sung Ching Hong a lot. Um, and Zhu Rongji um, as well. I would say, you know, Zhu I, it was not a, yes, he was the premier, uh, but he had, was a single issue 
uh, politician, the economy. Okay, so he ran the economy and he ran it well, and he ran it with an iron fist. You know, he was called one chop Jew, right? So things stop on his desk. If he's com to be compared to any of the five leaders, I would say it would be Xi Jinping. You know, he has the same sort of style uh, as Xi Jinping or vice versa. Um, so I have a lot of respect for what he did uh, with regard to the state-owned enterprise reform and, and the economy at that point in time, but he didn't really play a, a significant role in other issue areas. So, you know, we can't really put him in the same league as the top five top leaders who had uh, had to deal with everything from foreign to domestic affairs. Well, thank you, Ambassador Stapleton Roy, and especially to David Shambaugh. The book again is China's Leaders uh, from Mao to Now. Very glad that uh, both of you could join us and that everyone in the audience could be with us today. We'd also like to thank uh, Treyon Burgess and Ray Jung here at the Wilson Center for all of their help uh, in bringing this program to you today. And we hope to see all of you uh, remotely still uh, in the not too distant future. Thanks, David. Thank you, State.